Hello everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm Shilpa Shashikumar. Uh, I'm a Titans EHD postdoc at the University of Concepcion, Chile. Firstly, I would like to thank ASI for honoring me with this award for the thesis work that I had carried out at NCRA. I would also like to thank Professor Preeti Khab, who was my PhD supervisor, and all my collaborators for their invaluable scientific contributions towards this work. So straight away, coming to the questions that we had tried to address in my thesis. Uh, so one of the big open questions in extragalactic astronomy has been the following. Like why only a small fraction of the AGN launch radio jets that extend to several kiloparsec scales or even megaparsec scales, whereas the vast majority of the AGN population launch very weak outflows. So this is the so-called radio loud, radio quiet AGN dichotomy. So the question is, what causes this dichotomy? And in the literature, there has been several explanations. For example, intrinsic differences uh, between these classes, uh, such as in terms of supermassive black hole properties, or the jet production mechanisms, or magnetic field configurations, etc. As well as there are explanations uh, arising from external reasons, such as galactic properties and uh, host galaxy environments, etc. The growing consensus is that if you want to address this question, the best way to go forward is to uh, try to understand what is the dominant radio emission mechanism in different classes of AGN. So we know that in radio loud AGN, it's the jets which give rise to the radio emission, whereas for radio quiet AGN, we do not know what is the origin. Uh, if, it, if the radio emission is coming from the Blanford and Zanuck mechanism or Blanford and Payne mechanism or a combination of both. Similarly, the question that why the radio outflows in radio quiet AGN are small scaled or stunted is also a, a widely debated question. The third question is, is AGN feedback operational in radio quiet AGN? AGN feedback is an important constituent for uh, in cosmological simulations of galaxy evolution, and it plays a crucial role in the co-evolution of supermassive black holes uh, and their host galaxies. And studying AGN feedback in radio quiet AGN is very important because, as I mentioned, the vast majority of the AGN population in the universe is radio quiet. So in order to know how the universe is working, you need to really delve into the uh, uh, into uh, understanding the existence of AGN feedback in this poorly studied classes of quasars. So for this, we carried out a low frequency uh, upgraded GMRT study uh, at 685 megahertz for Palomar green quasar sample. Uh, this comprises of 87 quasars and type 1 Seaford galaxies. And this is an optically selected sample, so it's devoid of any radio selection biases. Out of 87 for our pilot sample, we chose 22 sources, out of which 20 are radio quiet and two are radio loud. Now based on a couple of analysis, such as you see on the right, radio, radio morphology, radio spectral index images, radio IR correlation, correlations between radio and black hole properties, as well as between radio and accretion properties. Based on all this, we concluded that the radio emission in one third of the radio quiet population is coming from AGN, meaning coming from jets or AGN driven winds, whereas in the remaining two third, it has contributions from both AGN as well as stellar related activities such as star formation, supernovae, starburst driven winds, etc. So at this point, uh, we are trying to illustrate that although radio morphology and radio spectral index imaging are in themselves very powerful tools, but they alone cannot uh, really discriminate between the different emission scenarios, such as jets versus winds. So therefore, we have approached this problem from a new perspective, which is radio polarimetry, uh, using the upgraded GMRT as well as VLA. And this is because we expect to see differences in the polarization signatures between jets and winds. And uh, polarization is important because the radio emission that we see is essentially the synchrotron emission coming from uh, relativistic electrons that are gyrating around magnetic field lines. And synchrotron emission is intrinsically linearly polarized. Therefore, polarization observations will tell you the order and orientation of the magnetic fields which is giving rise to these radio emission. So for the polarization study, we, uh, un we uh, selected the most extended source from our PG sample which is PG0007 plus 106, also known as 3's Wiki 2. It is also the first Seaford galaxy where a superluminal radio jet was discovered. So this uh, is the UGMRT 685 megahertz contours in black. Uh, and here, um, 
In addition to the primary lobes, we are also detecting a misaligned lobe towards the southwest uh, with a huge EMRT image, but it was not detected in the higher resolution VLA observations. And this misaligned lobe is most likely coming from a episodic activity of AGN. And there are indications that the episodic activity in this source uh, are occurring on very short timescales, such as on decadal timescales, uh, suggesting that the AGN in the source is sputtering or intermittent. Now coming to the polarization, the red ticks that you see are the electric uh, polarization vectors whose lengths are proportional to fractional polarization. And orientation is given by polarization angle. So this means that the regions where you see longer ticks are highly polarized regions, and regions that you see shorter ticks, such as the core, they are less polarized region. Now to, uh, to interpret uh, or to infer magnetic fields from these electric vectors or the chi vectors, we follow the synchrotron theory, which says that for optically thin regions, such as jets and lobes, the inferred magnetic fields will be perpendicular to these red vectors. And for optically thick regions like the core, the inferred magnetic fields will be parallel to the chi vectors. So therefore, we infer that the magnetic fields uh, in the UGMRT jet are essentially transverse to the local direction of the jet. And local direction of the jet is given by the blue tick. So now we can draw a simple analogy from a helical spring. Uh, which resembles a helical magnetic field. So when you have a helical field, you will have two components. One is along the uh, jet outflow, which will be the radial or the poloidal component. And the other would be the azimuthal component. And if you take a cross section, it would be the transverse or the perpendicular to the jet component. So and if you compress the spring, like you see here, what you effectively see are the transverse components, the red ticks. And if you uh, stretch the spring, basically these loops will open up. And what you effectively see are the poloidal components. So in the GeoGMRT image, what we are seeing is that uh, the transverse magnetic fields may either suggest shock compression, or they could also represent the toroidal component of a helical magnetic field. Here we present the VLA 5 gigahertz image uh, of the same source. And you see the misaligned lobe is missing here. Uh, in the core, the inferred magnetic fields turn out to be toroidal, which means that the inferred magnetic fields are toroidal at the base of the radio outflow, like you see in the small inset. So this is one possible explanation. That is, we are uh, picking up the toroidal component uh, uh, and the poloidal component of the helical magnetic field associated with the jet uh, from UGMRT and VLA images, respectively. But there's also an alternate explanation to these findings, which is the following. Now, in recent works, uh, there is a, a suggestion that uh, toroidal magnetic fields can thread AGN winds, and poloidal magnetic fields can thread AGN jets. So in that case, we cannot rule out the possibility of the toroidal magnetic fields that we see in uh, the transverse magnetic fields that we see in the UGMRT image being the toroidal fields threading an AGN wind that has been sampled on uh, larger spatial scales by the lower resolution UGMRT image, but not by the higher resolution VLA image. And uh, when we say wind, it could either be an accretion disk wind or uh, outer layers of a widened jet like a jet sheath, or even a combination of both. And in keeping with this model, uh, the VLA image, uh, the optically thin uh, J, J1 is an optically thin jet component. There, the inferred magnetic fields are the poloidal fields, which could be threading the spine of the jet. And uh, therefore, what we see here is a composite radio outflow, or rather a stratified radio outflow, where each strata of the outflow has distinct magnetic field geometries. And they are sp uh, sampled on different spatial scales, like a jet uh, plus wind or a spine sheet structure in the jet. And this kind of a composite outflow is also seen in Marker 231, uh, which is also another Seaford galaxy. I would just like to uh, highlight that we have developed a polarization pipeline, which is publicly available at this platform, which is able to reduce UGMRT band 4 polar polarization data. So now, as the radio outflow propagates through the ambient medium, there will be a lot of uh, mixing of this ambient gas uh, with the uh, jet plasma. So in order to understand uh, this mixing effects, uh, we have tried to uh, carry out uh, an emission line study combined with the radio polarization study. And here we find signatures of uh, the depolarization of the radio emission by emission line gas, which essentially means there is a lot of mixing and entrainment of the emission line gas in, uh, inside the lobes, uh, 
And there are also indications from uh, kinetic power arguments of these jets that there are uh, Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities uh, as well as stellar mass loading effects in these jets. Because these jets are low power, therefore they're susceptible to all these effects. So the signatures of jet wind, uh, jet slash wind ISM interaction uh, could possibly be a source of AGN feedback. So the question is, is AGN feedback operating in radio quiet AGN? The answer is we do not see global signatures of AGN feedback in these sources, uh, the ones that we have looked at, uh, in terms of removal of molecular gas or quenched star formation. But we do see small scale jet medium interactions, which could suggest that the AGN may be impacting the ISM locally, or it could be that the AGN feedback has been in its preliminary stage. Uh, as in the radio outflows may eventually impact the ISM, but they have been captured too early in their feedback process. And the third scenario is the relative evolution timescales uh, uh, of the gas outflows versus the AGN episodes. For example, the, outflow that, the gas outflow that we are looking at may not have been inflated by the current AGN episode. So now to put everything uh, on a single page, we have come up with a cartoon uh, model which uh, demonstrates a possible uh, indication a possible connection between changing spectral states of the accretion disk and this multi-component radio outflow so the model is the following the outer regions of the accretion disk is in the soft spectral state uh, and hence uh, because the magnetic flux accumulation close to the black hole is not efficient uh, enough for launching of powerful jets when you have a soft spectral state as in when you have a standard thin accretion disk so therefore the, it gives rise to strong winds and suppressed jets the inner regions of the accretion disk is in the hard spectral state, which gives rise to the uh, powerful jets. And this typical transition between the hard and soft spectral states occur uh, at, uh, at timescales of 10 to the power 6 to 10 to the power 8 years in regular radio loud and radio quiet AGN. Uh, whereas for intermittent sources like 3 wiki 2 this transition happens on relatively short timescales, as I mentioned, such as decades. So this all points to the uh, idea that radio loudness may be a function of the epoch at which the source is observed. Um, I'll just take one minute to round up. Um, its implications are that radio quiet Asian are, in, are the ones in their soft state launching uh, winds and suppressed jets. Radio loud ones are in their hard state, which are launching powerful jets. And radio intermediate ones are, in, um, are basically uh, having very fast transitions such that you may always see a moderately powered jet plus wind combination in them. So uh, this is my summary slide where I have the answers for all the questions. Origin of radio dichotomy, as I mentioned, radio loudness is the function of the epoch of observation. Uh, radio emission radio quiet agent is coming from multi-component stratified radio outflow. And when you have this multi-component outflow, there will be interaction between these outflow components as well as with the local gas environments. And this is giving rise to the stunted nature of the radio outflows. And finally, agent feedback in radio quiet agent uh, in terms of localized impacts is what we see. We do not see global signatures, but in spite of the lack of uh, large and powerful radio outflows in radio quiet AGN, they can still be efficient agents of AGN feedback. So that's where I stop. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have time for one or two quick questions. Yes. Uh, so my question is, uh, how you differentiated this uh, AGN and the stellar contribution here? I see. Uh, so that was the first project. So there, uh, so spectral contributions is basically coming from the radio IR correlation. So what we found is that one third of these sources are clearly lying about the radio IR correlation, and uh, they do have indications of barely resolved jets from the total intensity and spectral index images. The remaining two third is lying on the radio IR correlation, which suggests there are contributions from st stars. But then we do not rule out agent contribution in these sources because they also show indications of, uh, you know, uh, barely resolved jets from their spectral index and total intensity images. So we, hence we think there's a coexistence of both. Any more questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, we thank you, Shilpa. Uh, we will move on to the next award talk by Harsh Kumar an exploration of the relativistic transients realm with Growth India Telescope. So Harsh, you can see, I think the timer is here. Control 12 minutes. Yeah. Oh, do it. 
how the navigator. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Harsh. Uh, I'm currently a postdoc at um, Harvard uh, at Center for Astrophysics. But uh, most of this work I have done at, uh, while I was at IIT Bombay working with Professor Varun Bhalerao and Professor G.C. Anupma. Um, the whole thesis is centered around like following up the rare relativistic transient and preparing this telescope named uh, GIT um, to follow up all of these transients. Um, so the thesis is um, essentially, the, all the thesis work can be summarized as in one slide as it follows that uh, first of all I like prepared this uh, particular telescope named Growth India to do the automation, to develop the pipelines and subsequently like use it to follow up for the EMZ blue sources which are mainly uh, kilonova uh, which occurs when like there are two either neutron stars or, or a black hole and a neutron star merged together and give rise to the, the EMZW or, or kind of kilonova in the optical. Uh, the other aspect was to like follow up the gamma ray burst afterglow, which are optical, uh, mainly in the optical, although the, the, it's being like produced all over this uh, high energy to low energy um, range. And while searching for um, EMGW and GRB afterglows, I, we often encounter with like many of the fast transients, which are um, kind of rare in their own category. And so we, we fo um, did a collaborative effort to study these as well. And um, finally, I, I like I have some future. Uh, perspective that I would like to put up with where this all of this work uh, would be more relevant. So starting with the first thing, the the, meet, the telescope that I'm talking about is this uh, 0.7 meter um, telescope, robotic telescope, which is named Growth India. Uh, it's situated at the uh, IAO uh, at Hanle in Ladakh, and it's accompanied by this um, uh, this Endor camera, which is roughly a 16 megapixel camera w um, with a field of view about. 0.5 square degree, right, roughly twice the size of the full moon. Um, and this telescope has a unique combination of um, decent depth and the wide field of view, um, which is perfect for uh, looking for the new candidates as well as follow up the candidates which have already been found by the different observatories. So uh, my work was uh, started with like um, performing the scheduling part of this particular telescope. So I designed uh, it in, in a way that w um, which can be roughly divided into three way where there is a planning block, there is an observation block, and there is a TO block. I'll discuss these one by one. Um, so first of all, like the observation start by planning a night on, on this particular telescope where you add the targets to the queue, just fed in the parameters, and, that, and the uh, scheduler automatically handles the, all the calculation to when, that, when a particular target will go into this telescope. Uh, once that is done, the night start, uh, it take, acquires like the calibration exposure and then start um, observing all the targets that, that we have added um, onto this particular telescope one by one. Um, it uh, take into account all of, of the, like uh, communicating to different components of this, uh, of this particular telescope and observe everything and save everything to the, to the database or at the telescope location. There is a um, particular functionality that has been added, which is na I named as TO block, which is, um, you can add a target at any instant of time uh, on the night on this particular telescope. Um, so if there is a new event that happens, say in the midnight, um, you can directly add that to the telescope queue and overwrite everything else. Uh, also, there have been like quite a few automated bots that does the same thing by listening to a few public servers which where the alerts are being um, fed up. So they listen to those, um, process everything, and add everything to the telescope system. Um, the whole pipeline, the data reduction pipeline has also been automated. Um, so first of all, what pipeline does is that it downloads all the data from the telescope uh, site to IIT Bombay, uh, where all the processing happens. Uh, and once the data is there, it starts um, preparing the image for actual science use, which is I call as pre-processing. Uh, and then we do the main task of like measuring the brightness of different sources that are there, uh, which is photometry. Uh, it has different functionality to do that, including you can put a aperture or, or can fit the piece of model of that particular sources in the image. Uh, this is often okay for the isolated sources, but um, there are a few complicated scenarios where um, you need to perform something called as image subtraction, where the candidate is rightly embedded into the like center of the galaxy where there is a uh, significant com contribution coming from the galaxy also. So there you just take a reference image from a previous epoch where there was no transit at the same location. You subtract all of those um, images and actually get, get something like this where uh, we perform a search operation of where, what new candidate had popped in. Uh, we do a whole bunch of filtering using machine learning and then the typical filtering system. And finally we get like what, what are the real transients that are there. So this is how like the telescope system work. And um, I once this system was prepared, I started 
using this particular system for um, for looking for the Kilonovae in the LIGO um, sky maps that they put out. So um, to do that, like we needed maximize the efficiency of the telescope because we want to do more and more. We want to follow more upon more uh, events, take as many images as we can. So uh, using this automation stuff, we were able to maximize the efficiency of this particular telescope, starting from like the manual mode where it was roughly 30% on the full night. So it's just the like. Um, addition of all the science exposures and the readout from the camera. Only that there's no telescope movement included, no down movement included. And uh, after the full automation, the typical efficiency was roughly 85%. On few of the nights when there is no um, error, good, good weather and everything, it uh, sometimes goes up to 95%, which is, I think, maximum in the country as well as somewhere in the like, top of the world. So um, th that's how like that system has been designed. There are many boards that does a whole bunch of job for us, including the monitoring of the data, monitoring of the, the telescope operation and everything else. So uh, once the system was set up again, I started looking into the finding the Kilonova uh, during the ob observing run three from the LIGO where they put up these sky maps. Uh, we took two four sets where we looked into directly to the targets which were put up by the other observatories and we also search for the candidates on our own when there is a like suitable event coming in. So for example, this one where there was a, this bright patch uh, very near to the North Pole, so which we go into and form tile and look into the uh, different um, targets, uh, different transits that are uh, popping up in, within this region. Um, although we didn't find anything for this thing as well as for any other events that are there and so did the rest of the world. Um, and the question was like what we can do now. Uh, so. What we did is like we used these upper limits that we obtained from the follow-up of this particular event to model the different kilonova to rule out all of the, the kilonova models which are not favoring these upper limits. So we found that like the most um, exotic models which, which are saying that um, a ejector mass of 0.2 solar mass or more can be ejected from the BNS or BHNS can be ruled out using all of these observations. Uh, moreover, we combined all our observation and the upper limits with the whole growth collaboration, which are like a network of 20 different telescopes, and found that um, not more than 40% of the kilowatt can actually be brighter than minus 18 magnitude. So this is actually a very crucial number to um, decide the strategy during the 04, 05, and, and the upcoming LIGO runs to um, effectively find the counterpart um, during these observations. The second aspect was uh, to look for the GRB afterglow, so during like last Three years, once everything was automated, we started looking for these uh, public alerts, following up these public alerts, and uh, decided to follow up 70 of these GRBs uh, during last three years. The last three basically was from 2019 to 2022. Uh, and we actually detected more than 20 afterglows, um, including uh, one specific GRB, which was very interesting to me. Um, this was discovered by GTF, but then we started following up with GIT and a whole bunch of other Indian telescopes. And it resulted into like a vast majority of multi-band data set, which we tried to model it and looked into like what, what this shows us. And we found that like late time, there it's, it's showing something unusual. It's not following up this typical afterglow um, kind of behavior, which is a power law decay in, in the GRBs. Uh, to show it, it's, it's a zoom in view. Um, it doesn't significant. It doesn't look significant as of now. But when uh, if if we look at these numbers that that are calculated using these different fits that we have, we found that it's actually equally bright that of the afterglow at the at the particular instant of the time it happened. So we looked into what different model could have caused it, what, what's actually the physical reason around it, and we looked into various possibility and found that it's actually the refresh shock caused by collision of two shells of a GRB, which were actually emitted at that real time, but then like slowed down drastically in the time, and then a, the, a more um, a, a jet which is not dissolated much strike into that earlier shell, and they produce all of the, uh, ref uh, something called as refresh shock. Um, there are also different, I mentioned that we uh, occasionally found different rare candidates. I don't have time to explain all of them. But here is one of, uh, one of the candidates, which is this um, rare event occurred in 2022, early 2022, which was this jetted TD kind of uh, model, which is uh, unique on its own. It was very bright in X-ray, radio, and, and in optical. So um, when GTF detected it, it, it was like uh, a... Um, normal detection at around 18 magnitude, then we found a redshift and found that it is actually very, very bright. Um, the early observation showed that it's actually behaving something like a power law, so we earlier thought that it could be just a, like a typical GRB afterglow or an orphan afterglow, but uh, when we did observation with the GIT um, over 
next like few nights we actually found that there is a different component rising it's not just like a power law decay uh, and we found that uh, the second component actually is coming from a tidal disruption event uh, there was a whole bunch of processing done and um, this study was published very very recently um, yeah so that that's uh, was mainly all of the part but all all of these um, different work has their own future perspective um, the GIT automation has it will be actually very very useful when the this um, new facility will be coming up very soon in a couple of years. Uh, this will essentially have like a lot of number of uh, transient alerts. So we need some sort of an automated telescope which which is very very highly efficient to follow those up. Uh, although we need a bigger facility than GIT because GIT cannot attain like the same depth, but GIT will still be very very useful because in North the GTF will be the dominating force in uh, finding these candidates. Um, on the Kilona front, uh, we already have like detected a um, BNS event during 2017, which was this GW17817, which is kind of like the poster child event in the in the EMGW community. Um, but this doesn't reveal everything. It, it shows that the the origin of heavy elements can actually be produced by the BNS event or BHNS event. But um, the elements that were produced were actually only lined up to the second peak or a little bit further than that. We did not detect anything from the third peak. So we surely need more and more events to actually decide this solar abundance pattern where, where this third peak is coming from. Is it actually from the BNS, BHNS, which is likely the scenario, but we certainly need like more of such event to actually confirm the same. And we um, need to decide the strategy because there have been a lot of events put up by the LIGO and it's kind of hard of as of now to follow up every event. So we need to decide a strategy for a network of the telescope and highly efficient telescope which can do this. Um, on the GRB front, we are trying to get um, into early data as much as possible by uh, making the system as much faster as possible. The fastest we have been reached for so far is like 40 seconds right after the GRB event. But we need like to make it fa more faster so that we can get this early time data which can reveal this um, interplay of the reverse shock and the forward shock which Questions? I had a couple of questions. Um, uh, so you showed difference imaging uh, plot. Mm -hmm. um, so it, in that particular plot, was that like one shot from Growth India Telescope or was it a mosaic of? Uh, this, that was like one small cutout out of the full image of the GIT. It's just like, I think so one sixteenth so part of. Can you just pull it up? Because I was curious uh, yeah. why the, there is like uh, um, over subtraction around that. Bra Hello? This is the one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, <coughs> the reason that there is a like a bit, so that bit, is just saturation, bit of over saturation right? because of the saturation, yeah. So yeah. all of these stars are saturated and. No, at the, in the bottom plot, um, it's hard. Over to here also? Actually. No, no, not in the subtraction. In so the this is basically a reference image from the PANSARS. Yes. Uh, so in the reference image, do you know? It's not from the JIT. It's from like ah, a different okay. telescope because we, we don't yes. observe in the survey mode, so we don't have template for the whole sky. Okay, okay. So Got we it. use everything from the PANSARS, and then we do the subtraction uh, that, with that, the JIT. That's why, okay. And the second question is related to, like, can you uh, tell uh, the future of what can be done with Growth India Telescope? Um, Say Vera Rubin Observatory comes from. Yeah, so so I actually give a talk on the same prospect of the um, GWS yesterday, but I can summarize it again that um, in when we look at the like location of the growth India, it's mainly in the north, and LST will be like mostly in the south. There will be sure, surely some part that will be observable over there. And when we look for like the all of the candidates that will be coming from the LSST, it will be like much more deeper than what JIT can do. So there will be small fraction of those within that small patch of the the like middle of the equator or some sort of that that area so th we will have like not many events that we can follow but still it, it could be a number that we can surely go after and also like look for the um, the candidates that are coming from the gtf which is mainly like a dominating force at the similar depth to the git in the north thank you okay so i think now we'll move on to the next talk but thank you harsh i think you are dot on time okay. <laughs> so the next talk
It is fine, I can use this one. No, you can use it. Okay. Yeah. Hello, everyone, and uh, good evening. Sorry for this uh, disturbance. It was not uploading the presentation. Uh, first of all, thanks to ASI for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I am a postdoctoral fellow at uh, NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, but today I'll talk about. Uh, mostly the work that I have done uh, during my PhD at Physical Research Laboratory uh, under, uh, uh, with uh, Professor uh, Santosh Bhadawale and XSM team. So as title suggests, uh, my work is on uh, the solar atmosphere. Uh, so this is the image of the sun in different wavelength. Uh, the first one is the uh, invisible wavelength, uh, which is representing the solar surface. And this is the UV and X-ray image, which basically comes from the solar uh, atmosphere. So if we zoom into the, this portion of the sun, uh, the, it represents uh, how uh, the different uh, atmosphere uh, of the sun from photosphere to the corona looks like at different wavelength. So if we look into the temperature, the temperature at the surface is around uh, few, uh, in the order of uh, 10 to the power uh, 3 Kelvin, whereas the uh, corona is millions of Kelvin, so which is uh, much hotter than the solar surface, and this uh, from the uh, from uh, from the observation of this strange phenomena. So it has been given uh, the different phenomena has been given to understand this problem known as the coronal heating problem. The another problem is that uh, in the solar uh, corona, few elements like whose uh, fast transmission potential is less than 10 eV, such as the sodium, aluminium, magnesium. All of these elements are found to be uh, two to three times higher in the solar corona compared to the uh, photosphere. Whereas the other elements uh, like uh, nitrogen, argon, they remain same in both photosphere and corona. So this problem is known as the element and, uh, anomaly or the FIP effect uh, problem. So in this study, we, uh, we explore uh, both of these uh, problem uh, using the spectroscopic technique. And uh, for that, uh, we use the uh, uh, spectral observation of the sun, uh, X-ray spectral observation of the sun in, by using a solar X-ray monitor on board Chandrayaan-2. The solar X-ray monitor is a disk integrated uh, X-ray uh, uh, spectra, spectrometer uh, in the energy range of 1 to 15 uh, keV. So it, ha it is the uh, best uh, spectrometer uh, at, at times uh, in terms of energy resolution, cadence, and uh, the dynamic uh, range of the uh, instrument. So these are the few example observed spectra by uh, XSM at different uh, uh, activity of the sun. So these are the, uh, this is the observation of the XSM in its uh, first two uh, uh, observation session after its launch. It launched during the minimum of solar cycle uh, 24, covering the year 2019 uh, and uh, 20. So this is the uh, X-ray, flux observed by uh, XSM, and uh, here you can see this, bla uh, this uh, blue sided duration when uh, the sun was completely uh, quiet. So this blue sided duration, uh, the, the representative uh, full disk image are shown here in this uh, figure here. And uh, the enhanced uh, X-rays you can found, these are basically the presence of the uh, active region uh, on uh, the solar disk. So using the X-ray uh, spectrum of XSM, we derive the abundances and temperature of the uh, quiet pre period of the sun and the active period uh, of the sun and the elemental abundances of uh, magnesium, aluminum, and uh, silicon to understand the FIP effect. So here are the, uh, some represent representative results uh, from our study. So this is uh, corresponds to the, the left side corresponds to the complete quiet sun when no active regions were present 
whereas the right hand side it uh, when active regions were present so in the quiet period we found that uh, the abundances are intermediate between photospheric and coronal values uh, we found the abundance uh, in this uh, location in this plot whereas for the active region throughout the time we found the abundances are always coronal and they are uh, within the coronal range throughout the evolution of the active region so it is quite expected uh, from our understanding that uh, this uh, during this quiet phase most of the this x rays are coming from this tiny dots these are known as the x ray bright point and this has much less magnetic activity compared to the active region and because of that it is expected to have intermediate abundances compared to the active region we also have done the uh, time evolution of the abundances during the uh, during the flare as observed by xsm so this is the flare light curve uh, this gray uh, color here and these are the measured parameter this is the evolution of the temperature and this is the evolution of the magnesium uh, uh, so similarly we uh, derived for other elements and uh, other flares these are some representative uh, results uh, we found that uh, in the impulsive phase of the flare the abundances are uh, uh, there is a transition of abundance from coronal to the photospheric values and that can be explained uh, with the fact of uh, chromospheric evaporation during the flaring uh, process but in the decay phase we found there is a quick recovery of the abundances from photosphere to the coronal values and uh, this recovery is happened uh, within a few minute time scale and it is challenging to explain uh, this quick recovery of the abundances in the decay phase and for that we have given uh, two possible scenario and one of the possible scenario uh, is that uh, is based on the flare driven alfen wave as uh, shown here in this uh, cartoon so these waves are uh, present in con uh, uh, wave are known uh, conceptually but they are yet to be uh, detect uh, observationally so the fip uh, measurement could be the or the abundance measurement could be the indirect uh, observation uh, of this uh, alfen flare driven alfen waves the second uh, study is that to study the uh, heating of the uh, during the quiet phase of the sun and uh, to uh, so we ha we basically have two questions in this study Uh, one is that how much uh, the total x rays are coming from this uh, tiny x ray bright point uh, with respect to the whole uh, x ray emission from the sun and the second is the what uh, can nano flare be maintain the heating of this uh, x ray bright point and for that we combined the x ray observation of xsm with uh, uv observation uh, available from other uh, observatory and uh, we derived the uh, differential emission measure which is basically the measurement of the uh, uh, plasma emission at different temperature so here uh, this black color represent the uh, observed dm and uh, we from this we uh, estimate that more than 80% emission hot emissions are coming from this uh, x ray bright point also we combine this with uh, hydrodynamic simulation and uh, these are obtained from the simulation and we found that at high temperature both uh, simulation and observation matches well which uh, tells us that uh, nano flare can maintain uh, or it suggests basically the nano flare can maintain the heating of this uh, x ray bright points we also realized uh, so we also realized from this uh, study uh, that uh, to understand uh, uh, this two problem in more detail uh, we need uh, 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 imaging spectroscopy or spectral measurement uh, with spatial information uh, but in x ray uh, in in for, but to uh, get to need to realize of the x ray uh, means imaging spectroscopy we need uh, the uh, x ray optics which is challenging in several factors uh, first thing is that x rays are high energy photons uh, for, uh, because of that the normal uh, mirror like optical telescope cannot be used in this uh, in this case and we need a different type of uh, telescope that is called the ultra uh, telescope which is which relies on grazing incidence uh, principle of the x ray photon so this cartoon shows uh, uh, a uh, basic mechanism of this uh, of this technique uh, so uh, in uh, in our lab we have initiated the development of or uh, in uh, of this uh, x ray optics uh, this x ray optics relies on the x ray mirrors and uh, before producing the actual x ray mirrors we need to uh, op we, we need to design the x ray mirrors uh, and for that we have developed a uh, developed a software package named as uh, darpanex 
So this package can be used uh, for uh, any kind of de uh, design of X-ray mirror uh, uh, according to our science uh, purpose. Also, it can, it, it can be useful to, uh, to characterize the experimental uh, X-ray reflectivity data of this X-ray uh, mirror. So these are the uh, setup uh, in our lab uh, at PRL uh, to, to produce these X-ray mirrors. Uh, so these are the some uh, X-ray mirrors uh, di for different, uh, uh, different parameters uh, for, this, uh, for, for these mirrors. So we have uh, tested these mirrors using the uh, XRR facility, X-ray reflectivity facility, uh, and then uh, we, uh, we analyze the data using our DARPANX uh, code, and uh, this is uh, shown here uh, in this figure. Uh, also, we have uh, studied a conceptual design of imaging spectrometer uh, for the sun, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which can be useful for the imaging spectroscopy uh, in, uh, in future. So this, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a ray diagram of this uh, uh, conceptual design. It consists of X-ray optics here, uh, with parabolic and hyperbolic X-ray mirrors. And here there is a uh, focal plane uh, detector module. So these are some uh, input, uh, uh, these are some instrument parameters depending upon uh, our, uh, our science uh, requirement. And using this, uh, using this parameter, we have uh, tested the performance of this uh, instrument uh, for uh, different uh, science uh, cases that uh, we want to explore uh, in this uh, study. Uh, so with that, uh, I, I would like to acknowledge uh, all the persons who are uh, involved or uh, uh, supports uh, this uh, study. I would like to acknowledge uh, my PhD supervisor, Professor Santos Varawale, and XSM team, and my colleagues, collaborator, and uh, friends. So thank you. Thank you, Vishwajit. We have time for one quick question. Okay, I don't see any hands raised, so I think, thank you again. We'll move thank on. Thank you. Uh, very good evening, and uh, so I will talk about mapping lunar surface chemistry uh, using the class and uh, X-ray solar monitor payloads uh, one chandra and two. Um, so composition is a very basic fundamental parameter that is uh, that that we need to know for any planetary body uh, because that that forms the basis for any models no, that we talk about, about origin and evolution of the body. And for the moon, it's uh, more Im uh, important also from the perspective that uh, moon is a body to which uh, you know, we have access to, and uh, there is a lot of prospect for in, uh, in situ resource utilization, future permanent settlements. So for both from a point of view of lunar science and exploration, the composition of moon is a very important uh, parameter. Um, so uh, what we do on Chandrayaan-2 with class uh, is that uh, we do remote X-ray fluorescent spectroscopy. Because it's an airless body, we can uh, 
measure the X-ray fluorescence that comes from the surface of the moon, uh, and how does it happen uh, when there is a solar activity and a solar flare falls on the surface of the moon? Uh, it triggers X-ray fluorescence from the atoms on the surface of the moon, and we get a lunar XRS spectrum. Uh, so, uh, if it, because it's a spectrometer, the energy of the photons gives you very uniquely. You can identify the atoms from which it is em emitted, and thus the element. Um, and uh, the strength of the line uh, is related to the uh, abundance of the element. So uh, that's the principle on which this is based. Um, uh, are there uh, other methods? Yes. So gamma ray spectroscopy is the uh, method that's been used at the moon earlier. Uh, but for comparison, uh, sh shown here is a gamma ray spectrum from the lunar prospector uh, gamma ray spectrometer, which was flown in 1998. And uh, the maths from GRS is still the basis for uh, you know, the uh, elemental studies that we have done for the moon. So uh, in, for a comparison, we have the class spectrum on the left, and uh, which is in x-rays, and the gamma ray spectrum on the right. So what, what I want to point out is the fact that uh, while uh, gamma ray spectroscopy uh, can be done without the aid of a solar flare, and therefore it ha always has a better coverage, uh, the problem here arises in deconvolving this into uh, abundances. As you can see, uh, the black line here is the spectrum, where, uh, whereas under that you can see uh, 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 very many lines uh, which are contributed from all these elements. So spectral deconvolution in the case of gamma ray spectroscopy is very challenging, whereas in the case of x-rays, uh, it's in that way pretty straightforward because uh, you know you can you can resolve these lines and uh, there is no ambiguity in the uh, detection of the element itself uh, and therefore uh, uh, orbital x-ray fluorescent spectroscopy is used here it's one of the most direct approaches as i've said uh, and uh, allows an ambiguous detection of all major elements so on the moon when, when we talk of major minor and trace elements major elements are those whose compositions are greater than one weight percentage so uh, in planetary science we talk about like if you know all of the composition we call it 100 and then we assign percentages to the elements that you detect um, and, and hence uh, we, here we are talking about major elements is anything that's greater than one weight percentage and a quantitative estimation is possible in the case of X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy because it's basically based on the fundamental uh, equations, established cross-sections in X-ray spectrometry. Um, and it is also these uh, kind of measurements are insensitive to the crystal structure. I'll give an example, if you go to uh, infrared, where also you can see, for example, ion lines, ion absorption lines can be seen uh, in uh, remote sensing, uh, which uh, result from crystal field transitions of Fe2+. Plus. Uh, but then they are sensitive, the band depth and the band centers are sensitive to the mineral that hosts the element. Whereas in um, X-rays, it's insensitive to that and to other uh, parameters like weathering on the moon because moon surface is always exposed to solar wind. There is the phenomena of weathering that happens uh, which affects the reflectance in the visible and the IR, whereas X-rays, uh, it's not. Um, and also um, surface temperatures or any other such environmental parameters. There are limitations. The signal very strongly depends on the solar activity. And hence, uh, you know, if, if there are no flares, we hardly see anything. If there's a strong flare, that's very good. Um, that, therefore, what happens is that it limits the coverage that we get. Uh, the, it only samples the very top 100 micron, um, whereas uh, you know, there are very few methods for composition that can go deeper. So most of what we do in remote sensing is the very top layer. So the assumption is that it is representative of the deeper crust. Uh, also, technologically, X-ray spectrometers have tens of kilometers of uh, spatial resolution that is achievable, uh, whereas if you go to a visible uh, uh, spectrometer, uh, or you know, if you use in the visible or IR, you get hundreds of meters. So those are limitations, uh, but um, X-ray fluorescence has been done, and in fact, the very uh, first USSR uh, uh, experiment Luna 10 had a X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, but there are no results. So here is a comparison of all the X-ray spectrometers that flu that is flown to the moon with the aim of uh, global uh, lunar elemental ma mapping. Uh, so after Luna 10, there is Apollo 15 and 16, which sort of established the method. Um, there is literature on that. They use gas proportional counters, um, and they have maps of magnesium, aluminum, silicon from a region near the equator. I'll show you a map in the next uh, slide. There was Smart One, which, which was an ESA mission, uh, had a DKIX, uh, which is actually the precursor for class, I should say, because they used uh, devices called swept charge devices, a variation of which is what we are also using. 
Uh, but again, it also ha uh, suffered some radiation damage because of a long journey to the moon. There was Kaguya, uh, which is Japanese mission, had an X-ray spectrometer with a very high uh, geometric area, 100 centimeters square. They used X-ray CCDs, but by the time they reached the moon, uh, it was severely underwent uh, radiation damage. Uh, Chang'e 1 and 2 mission, the Chinese missions had a small area silicon pin, uh, but it's like very few uh, results from it uh, for a very small part of the moon. It had kicks on Chandrayaan-1, uh, which performed uh, very, uh, very well indeed, but the mission itself lasted only nine months, and it was a very uh, solar, uh, the solar activity was very low, um, and hence I, I think totally we had 32 flares, and results have been very limited. Um, and next we have Chandrayaan-2 class, uh, whose design uh, you know, basically came from all these previous experience working on uh, Chandrayaan-1 kicks. Um, so we use this novel detectors called uh, swept charge devices, uh, and today we have we have detected all the major elements. Uh, apart from that, even some minor elements, and we have sort of the best footprint, 12.5 kilometer. Uh, I mean, uh, if you look at comparing to all the earlier ones, that's the best map we we are generating. Um, so uh, putting that in a, a, a plot. Uh, what you can see is before Chandrayaan 2 went up, this was the coverage in X-rays of the moon. Um, all these blocks uh, show from all the missions put together what was covered in X-rays, and it's about 20%. Um, and today, uh, with Chandrayaan 2, you have almost 95% coverage. Um, so the major science results, uh, we have the largest coverage elemental maps at the highest spatial resolution for all the major elements of the moon. So that's the basic objective of the experiment, and uh, pr it pretty much did that. Um, apart from that, we also had the first map of sodium distribution of the moon. Uh, I'll talk about that a little more in the next slide, because sodium is important. Uh, and uh, we modeled it uh, to find that sodium is probably exists as an adsorbate layer. Um, we also first remote mapping of minor elements. So as I said, this was meant for major elements uh, which constitute the surface, but um, because we do have a large collecting area and the sensitivity is quite high, uh, we, could, we are also able to map even minor elements of you know, 0.5 to 0.6 weight percentages. Um, now, X-ray solar monitor, as I said, to uh, get back the abundances from the lunar XRF spectra, a very critical parameter is to look at the sun and uh, model the solar spectrum itself, which is actually triggering the lunar X-ray fluorescence. So there, therefore, we have XSM, uh, which is simultaneously looking at the sun. Um, apart from uh, you know uh, helping with the XRF experiment, uh, it also does independent solar science. Vishwajit actually talked about it, uh, but again to cover uh, just the highlights, um, it has the largest dynamic range. Uh, really covers the solar flares from sub A class to X class. This is also important for class because you know when we are able to do with the large area A class to X class, the solar spectrometer also should be able to do that. So in that way, it perfectly matches the situation. Um, XSM independently also looking at elemental abundances in quiet sun and flares. Um, and you heard from Vishwajit how uh, the abundances uh, in the sun, coronal abundances evolve during a flare and uh, possibly the first observational indication that the flare induced alpha waves, and also the multi-thermal aspect of plasma in flares. Um, so these, these are the maps that's been published, but uh, we are quickly filling it. Um, uh, you, you can see the, um, sorry, yeah. So magnesium map, for example, is the first ever such map. Uh, there is only ion map, which has been derived from um, you know, previous uh, experiments in different ways. Uh, mo mostly relying on empirical relations between Apollo samples, which have been brought back, and the reflectance measurements. So, uh, except for iron, all other ones are actually quite new maps, I should say. Um, and uh, uh, we have these, uh, these maps are uh, not complete yet, but yes, uh, what we have plotted here is the you know, best quality data that's been published. Um, the sodium distribution of the moon was mapped for the first time. The major result is that it exists as an adsorbate layer. So when we say we detect an element, what you mean is that this is part of a crystal uh, or the mineral that's per, uh, present on the surface of the moon. Now, uh, here what you see is some enhanced abundances of sodium, and it changes with the local solar time. It's higher towards the poles that you can roughly see that uh, if you plot uh, uh, you know, uh, from pole to pole, you see that uh, it tends to be higher towards the uh, poles. Uh, and also shows a north-south asymmetry. So what we did was to model this using a Monte Carlo, uh, using Gian 4, we actually modeled the lunar regolith, um, and uh, 
uh, built in different layers of sodium, which is sitting on the surface of these grains, and uh, use that model to fit the data, which shows that uh, possibly a large part of the signal that we observe are coming from this adsorbate layer. So what this means is that um, uh, you know, the exosphere, moon has a very thin, tenuous atmosphere, we call exosphere, and this exosphere starts from the surface itself. So the source of atoms in the exosphere is obviously coming from the surface. But uh, to really connect what processes displays atoms from the surface to the exosphere, so far it's all based on models. And uh, uh, though there are independently uh, measurements of the exosphere and of the surface, there has not been any such tracer possible so far. So with uh, a map of sodium uh, and ground observations of sodium that actually we have been doing from uh, Kavalur at uh, VBT um, in collaboration with uh, Shivrani at IAA, uh, you, you should please check out the poster that Ashish has um, downstairs. So we, we are able to detect lunar uh, exospheric sodium um, using ground telescopes and then you have a map of sodium using class. So you, you get for the first time uh, a direct connection between what is the surface, what is on the surface, on and what is in the exosphere, and also because sodium is a moderately volatile element. Uh, so, I mean, the, according to the formation of the moon, most of the volatile elements should have evaporated away at the very early stages of lunar formation. So, you don't expect actually uh, a lot of sodium in the crust of the moon itself. Uh, so, here, uh, what we have uh, is, you know, a possibility to address many of such basic questions. Um, so, uh, that work is. Uh, in progress. Um, also, to uh, wanted to point out, so, so we also make very high resolution maps, uh, very high in the sense, uh, 12 kilometer to 15 kilometer, which is again the first time. Uh, for example, this is a map of magnesium at the Chandrayaan landing site, which is in the star here. Uh, we uh, even before Chandrayaan went up, we knew that it's a fairly uniform composition uh, site, and that's a spectrum from there where you can even see these minor elements. Um, uh, on the uh, at the Chandrayaan 3 uh, landing site. Uh, of course, when they land, it's at a very uh, small area that you measure. But uh, even before that, we knew that it's a uh, you know the composition is fairly uniform. Whereas what I have here is a slim landing site that uh, recently uh, the Japanese mission Slim that landed here, uh, and where you see is it, it's a very uh, heterogeneous site. So, so some interesting signs over there. Um, also, uh, to just highlight the points from XSM. Um, XSM, uh, this is an overall light curve of XSM, um, and, and you can see the increase in uh, solar activity uh, as we now we go from the launch. So this started operating in September 2019, and this entire data uh, plotted together. Uh, you can see how the activity is increasing. Um, and as I said, it goes down to sub-A class microflares, uh, which allows you to do, so there are like 98 sub-A class microflares outside the active regions. And uh, this is a very important question uh, in solar physics. Um, uh, plotted is here is the flare frequency. So all this is enabled because of the high sensitivity that XSM has. Um, also the fact that uh, uh, the spectral fits to uh, XSM, uh, which we also have to do because it's very important that we need to know what is falling on the moon. Um, uh, this is from the XSM team, and you can see that uh, what it suggests is that a single component isothermal plasma is not enough to model uh, the uh, so solar flares even in this energy range. And what they need to do is add a hotter component. And so there is evidence for a direct heating near the reconnection region. Um, so we should have talked about XSM, so I'm not going into the abundance part of it. Um, and we, of course, have to say behind the scenes, all this is enabled because of the uh, great quality instrument, both class and XSM, uh, that's been possible. Um, so these are the X-ray spectrometers. That's class, uh, and that is XSM. Uh, class has a 64 centimeter square area, um, and uh, uh, this is a much smaller uh, single silicon pin detector. Sorry, SDD detector. Um, uh, just to uh, give an inside look at class. Uh, so this is based on these swept charge devices. So they are a variant to X-ray CCDs, except that it doesn't have position information. So each of this here is one detector, and you have a quadrant of four detectors. Uh, and we got it as a quadrant. So these are also the same detectors that's flown on the HXMT mission, Chinese uh, X-ray astronomy mission. Um, and over that, you have a collimator, which defines the field of view. So this is not imaging. We have to restrict the 
field of view using collimators. So you have these copper collimators, uh, which are fixed on this. Over that is the visible light filter, um, just showing a blown up view of uh, you know, the independent elements that uh, constitute the detector here. And here you can see uh, four such quadrants making together 16 uh, subcharge devices. Uh, this is a picture of class on the spacecraft. You have a door. Uh, as I said, many of the early emissions suffered from radiation damage. Um, so we, we carefully designed the uh, door. There's a mechanism here to close the door um, en route to the moon. Uh, and you can see these here, there are radioactive sources, IN55, 16 of them, each of them shining on a uh, pun detector each, uh, which was used for onboard calibration. So the door was closed and then opened uh, onboard in the lunar orbit. Uh, uh, XSM, um, uh, it's uh, again the same energy ranges class. Uh, it has a beryllium filter attenuator to, uh, so that the complete uh, energy range can be covered. Uh, so that comes on about M5 class of flares. has a very good energy resolution and a very good cadence. Uh, one second, you get uh, one, one second uh, cadence here. Uh, and as a, again, uh, the dynamic range is very high, and it's been operating for now four and a half years. Um, again, uh, uh, to uh, give an overview of all the tests that's been done and how well calibrated this was, um, the, this is the switch charge device, as I said, because it's not uh, position sensitive. The readout is diagonal, and uh, uh, this is a, a vertical structure of the device. So what we did was to actually model uh, the device. Um, uh, here you, you can see was for a similar device, which was on kicks. We had done a charge transport model uh, for the swept charge devices. Uh, it was uh, uh, modeled and simulated and verified with ex experimental data. And we uh, then ex uh, extended it to the CCD 236 that's on class. Um, and you can see that uh, here what is shown uh, is at the different structures in the SCD, how the energy distribution, the spectral energy distribution differs. So it's these models that we have used for the response metrics of the instrument. Um, we independently also looked at the collimator blocking fraction. Um, uh, the, uh, the detection efficiency was uh, of these devices were done at a synchrotron facility in Bessie II in Germany uh, by, with some collaboration with the Open University. Uh, so we have absolute values of the efficiency, uh, particularly in the low energies where it's very important. Uh, you know, theoretical calculations don't work very much there. And so, to, so together, this is the effective area of the device uh, for the 16 uh, SEDs together. Um, so what I mean to say is that there was a very good background uh, of the response of the devices. Um, we also did a ground calibration. So this was a vacuum chamber that we have um, in uh, eyesight uh, at ISRO. Um, and so we have class here, and uh, we used uh, X-ray source, illuminated the, all of the SCDs, and uh, did ground calibration. You can see the full width at half maximum as a function of temperature for all the 16 devices um, in orbit. Um, so uh, this is a performance in orbit, so onboard when you shine the IN55 sources, uh, this is what we get, and that's what is on the ground. So, uh, you know, because of the uh, presence of the door, there was absolutely no degradation in the device, uh, even after passing through the radiation belts. Um, the difference in the background is because once you go up, uh, there are particles, and so what you see here, the continuum is coming from the galactic cosmic rays. Um, and on using the onboard source, we validated the response metrics that we have. Um, you have a very good match uh, of, uh, you know, modeling the, uh, onboard source spectrum. Uh, XSM also went through a very rigorous uh, calibration phase, um, mostly done at RRCAT uh, uh, in Indore. Uh, and the refinements were done in orbit to the effective area, also compared with the uh, GOES measurements. Um, and uh, uh, no, uh, this, this is refinement, which is, again, uh, always ongoing. Um, and uh, have a, a very good handle on the effective area now. Uh, consistent spectral performance over the years, you can see that from 2020 to 2023, the uh, spectral quality is maintained. Uh, the angular response of the measurement also uh, been done ground because uh, for, this is very important for XSM because effective area changes with the collimator response. Um, uh, and hence, all this put together, uh, both class and XSM has a very good handle on the response matrices and hence, uh, our, our uh, confidence on the spectral measurements are quite high. Um, uh, the class data analysis methodologies were also, uh, uh, you know, we developed them, in fact. So uh, uh, basically uh, what we need to do is to invert um, 
the observed X-ray fluorescence spectra into abundances. So very detailed modeling is done, experimental verification was done. Um, so all this goes into uh, finally getting the best fit abundances. So here, very important, as I said, is to use the uh, model spectrum from XSM. Uh, this to just show sample spectra. You can see um, a spectrum of class and uh, a fit, spectral fits in both cases. Um, uh, and we also uh, went through the uncertainties in the data uh, and how those are propagated. Uh, for example, uh, when we have XSM solar spectrum, this is a spectral fit to the class uh, lunar spectra, whereas uh, there are times when XSM, uh, the sun is not in the field of view of XSM and we have to rely on GOES. Uh, and one fact is that most of the X-ray spectrometers in such similar experiments do use GOES. They really don't go for a real uh, spectral modeling of the solar uh, spectra. But what we find is that this is extremely important. As you can see, the spectrum doesn't even fit uh, if you don't have a real uh, good spectral model for the sun. And uh, we also propagated errors uh, with and without XSM. You can see there are systematic uncertainties that creep in when you use only the GOES flux. Uh, so the whole data is archived. Uh, it's available uh, at Pradhan, uh, which is the ISSDC uh, site. Um, and uh, XSM has an independent portal uh, at PRL, uh, where you can also, using a GUI, plot light curves. Uh, so in summary, uh, lunar elemental mapping um, at the highest resolution, largest coverage with the XRF experiment, which is both class and XSM combined. Um, and uh, these spectrometers were developed in-house. Uh, XSM at PRL and class uh, in URSC this row. There's a detailed, very rigorous ground calibration carried out, response matrices de uh, derived, analysis methods developed, and the data pipeline developed and released in the public archive. So we continue to provide high quality uh, data resulting in uh, scientific results. I'll stop here with the a list of uh, people uh, who's been awarded as part of the th uh, theme. Um, just also like to point out that um, uh, Radhakrishna is the PI for class and XSM is Santosh. Uh, and the former PI for class was uh, Srikumar. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We, have, we can take a couple of questions. Yes. Yes, so we did night sight. So we didn't point at the dark sky. It's basically in situ particles. So we have night sight observations. Um, from that, we get the continuum background. So I guess that's about all. I don't see any hands raised. Thank you, Shama. Thank you. The next talk. Uh Okay, so good evening, and uh, so I am presenting this talk on behalf of Infrared Astronomy Group of TIFR. So,
this one we can use. Okay. This is fine. Okay. Okay. So at the outset, I would like to, I mean, on behalf of Infrastructure Student Group, uh, uh, we will wish to thank uh, ASI uh, Jubin Kimbhavi Award Committee for uh, recognizing the contribution of the group uh, for observational and instrumentation work in astronomy, as well as Ajit and Asha Kimbhavi for instituting this award. So this is the brief outline of my talk. So rather giving a science talk today, I thought I will give the history of instrument development in TIFR. So my first part of my talk will be the early era, around 70s and 80s, uh, where in instruments were developed for far infrared astronomy as well as near infrared astronomy programs in the country. So my main focus today will be on uh, uh, last three decades of work where our main emphasis was basically on near-infrared astronomy observations with one to four meter class Indian telescope, where we have developed many focal plane instruments. So I will show those uh, uh, development programs. And uh, these instruments, basically, our policy is that once these instruments are developed, they are actually open for user community immediately. So most of these instruments are now used worldwide. And uh, also, I will, if time permits, I will give that we have been very extensively working on the IR payloads for the satellite programs uh, when we have opportunities from a small satellite program from ISRO and so on. So this is the brief history from early 70s to late 90s, basically on balloon-bound and ground-based astronomy. So this table basically shows that uh, Far in, uh, the beginning of far infrared astronomy uh, started in TIFR in early 70s with a moderate size of telescope, balloon bond telescope, which was flown on balloon from uh, Hyderabad, where we have a national facilities with a single channel photometer with wide wavelength coverage. Then uh, 80s, it was upgraded to 75 centimeter, again with single channel photometer. Then uh, 80, the early 80s, uh, we went to 100 centimeter with uh, two channel bolometers, basically photometer and now we are actually doing a lot of far infrared spectroscopy at C2 line with the same telescope, 100 centimeter telescope. So this is the photograph of 30 centimeter far infrared telescope with a very uh, moderate size diameter. That time we have only two axis stabilization, pointing accuracy was very coarse. And this telescope was actually flown five times from Hyderabad and basically to study the star forming region in far infrared wavelength. Then it was upgraded to 75 centimeter in 1980s. Uh, we improved the, uh, basically the oriented system from two axis to three axis. And the pointing accuracy was also improved from six arc minute to 5.5 arc minute. And unfortunately, this telescope had only one launch and we lost this telescope uh, during the first flight itself. By, by the way, this uh, data from this launch was very useful. This was basically the part of PhD thesis of Professor S.K. Ghosh, actually. And then we moved to 100 centimeter far infrared telescope in 1983. And uh, this telescope has pointing accuracy of now 0.3 arc minute. Actually, we can basically, uh, uh, basically construct the ima images with one arc minute resolution at 200 micron. This telescope has been flown already 27 times since 1983. And now we are doing a lot of spectroscopy using this telescope. So these are the photographs of some of my old colleagues who were involved in far infrared pro program. From where you can see young Professor Tandon here, Professor S.K. Ghosh, Professor Burma, Rangarajan, and Angar uh, from 30 centimeter to 75 centimeter and 100 centimeter. And all these team members have, uh, that era has already superinated long time back. And uh, around 1980s, uh, Parallelly, we also started ground-based program uh, within the country with single-channel NIR detector, which were available that time, uh, basically led by Iyengar and their group, Rangarajan and S.K. Ghosh. So in 80s, early 80s, a uh, lot of near-infrared observation in GHK bands were carried out using the lead sulfide detector, which was basically cooled from dry ice. And this was used to study the variable stars like delta SQT and so on. Then late 80s, we moved basically to the single channel indium antimony detector and that be because uh, that time 1983 there was a launch of IRA satellite uh, infrared satellite and there are a lot of follow-up observations were carried out with this detector which was uh, liquid nitrogen cooled and this was used in various telescopes like one meter UPSO Rangapur observatory as well as Kowloon and so on 
And these indium antimony detectors, which were used at that time, are still maintained by us in our lab, which were actually used for experimental projects for TI for uh, first year PhD student for their experimental coursework. And this is one very nice old paper, discovery paper, which were made uh, with single channel indium antimony detector. That time, actually, they discovered some of the IRA sources, which were unassociated uh, with the dust cell. And there's uh, this very historical paper, which were basically using the one meter UPSC telescope and this single channel infrared detector. Now I will move to the early 2000, uh, where uh, my, my talk will focus more on uh, uh, brief history of last two and a half decades. So in last two and a half decades from early 2000, we are basically doing a lot of instrumentation for the ground-based program because we moved from single channel to array detectors, and uh, I will focus more on these ground-based program. These were from different uh, array detectors from 500, 12 by 500 to 2K by 2K kind of detectors. And in the meantime, we also did a lot of extensive instrumentation program for a small satellite program, uh, particularly for when we have opportunities from ISRO. And also we are continuing our balloon program with upgraded telescopes and uh, also we have a plan to upgrade our detectors. And particularly we moved from photometer to spectroscope, uh, spectrometer in late 90s. So this slide basically gives up the progressive plan of our ground-based astronomy. Uh, we actually started our journey from a small array, uh, which is 58 by 62 Indian antimonite array, which was available that time. Actually, uh, in that time, actually only few in the world like uh, TIFR and UCART in Hawaii and so on have actually this array which were procured from Santa Barbara. And we actually developed this uh, uh, camera. Uh, so this array was basically sensitive up to 5 micron, but our optics allow us to use up to L band 3.6 micron. And we actually use this telescope from 1.2 meter Mount Abu uh, in early 2000. And uh, we actually got very exciting result. First time in, we got the photons in the L band from Indian facilities. And this encourages us to develop this for larger format. This was one of the quadrant of Aladdin array of Indian Antimonite, 512 by 512. And this upgraded camera, TIRCAM and to TIRCAM2, actually used in Ayuka Giravali telescope for many cycles for in near infrared observation. And around this time, we realized that uh, we were lacking in the near infrared spectroscopy in the country, particularly for Indian community. And we, dis we had an opportunity to develop instrument for SCT, Himalayan Chandra Telescope. So we decided to develop a spectrometer in NIR band, uh, wave band for Indian community by using 1K by 1K Hawaii one pace array. That was the first generation Hawaii array. And finally, when we had a opportunity to develop instrument for India's largest telescope, we went to 2K by 2K S2 RG array. So briefly, uh, TRICAM2 is basically a camera which can observe up to 3.6 micron, although detector allows us to use up to 5 micron. And this uh, basically the unique camera in the country because this is the only camera which is available for observation beyond 2.5 micron K band. And uh, recently we have upgraded this array uh, to sub-array mode because there are a lot of user demands for high cadence observations and fast readout. And uh, this was actually upgraded very recently. Now we can actually do the sub-array observation using this camera. And another thing which these array detectors were used because uh, the, uh, in India, Indian facilities, we never characterize the site for NIR observations, NIR wavelengths. So this also gave, up, gave us opportunity to characterize the site for NIR observations. So this TIRCAM2 was used for characterization of Devastal optical, uh, Devastal site. And you can see we got a fantastic uh, atmosphere condition, very sub-arc second seeing condition, and you can see in the image compared to two mass image, which has poor resolution, you can see high resolution images from DOT. Then we moved to the instrumentation for SCT uh, around uh, to early 2000, uh, basically to, uh, 2010 and so. So SCT already had a, one of the NIR, NIR detector which has two modes of amazing observations, uh, which has form, which has format of 512 by 512. But unfortunately, this detector had some problem with pixel defects. So we decided, although in the beginning we thought that we are going to develop only spectrometer, but since we also need imaging, so this camera was basically developed for both imaging and spectroscopy, uh, and it is right now at the permanently at the side port of SCT. And uh, the advantage, so, so imaging basically gives you five arc minute by five, five arc minute field of view with uh, 1,200 
uh, kind of resolution for NIR wave bands. The advantage is putting it side port because in the main port you have an optical spectrograph, so you can actually do near simultaneous observations with optical and NIR in the same night. It just takes to flip the uh, tertiary inner in just a couple of minutes. And this actually used this camera by many students for their PhD thesis. Uh, for their work. So this telescope is now used not only for galactic sources, it has been also used for extra galaxy sources. So these are just some representative example like uh, imaging of galaxies, extra galaxies, supernovae, and so on. And uh, now this, we are actually upgrading this camera because this spectrometer has already completed 10 years of its lifetime. And particularly this detector lifetime is like five to 10 years. So we basically use the first generation Hawaii array, but now we have a better Hawaii array, which are called H1 RGF uh, focal plane array. And basically these detectors has a low readout noise and larger well capacity so that one can actually do the more sensitive observations. So we are basically upgrading, replacing this array with the Hawaii H1 RG, which can basically extend the lifetime of this array for further 10 to 15 years, as well as we are actually upgrading the readout for faster readout because we have a lot of user demands for faster high cadence observation. And I also want to emphasize that these sub array capabilities which we have developed in these cameras are actually widely used for international programs. So this is one example where there was an international campaign, for example, to um, observe the Pluto occultation which happened in 2021 and actually uh, from these uh, site from uh, like uh, DOT, actually we could get a high cadence observation of Pluto occultation. Recently we also have a Triton's uh, occultation, this is a Neptune satellite which was also observed with uh, T-Respec from SCT and we also doing a lot of lunar occultation observation using these sub-array capabilities which is very important observations to determine precisely the stellar parameters of the star like diameter and so on. And uh, then uh, we moved to the 10 spec, which was joint collaboration between TIFR and ARIES. This was a very nice example of interinstitutional collaboration where we jointly developed 10 spec for DOT. And this is a unique camera in the country in the sense that it can observe simultaneously from optical to infrared wavelengths. And uh, it also has a imager, but a small field of view. And uh, resolution of spectrograph is 2700. And it has a fantastic sensitivity. It can go much deeper, like 1992 in K band. And and also you can do the optical imaging with this camera up to 23 magnitude in uh, uh, R band. And again, this camera was used for really deep imaging observation and spectroscopy. You can see uh, we have got sub in seeing condition from DOT, uh, which can be reflected in this image, a very high sensitive images of particularly one of the global clusters. And the beauty of this camera is that, as I mentioned, uh, one can actually simultaneously observe from optical around 0.5 micron to 2.5 micron uh, in the one shot, in one observations. And that basically, uh, the idea is that because this camera is generally used in the main port, and uh, if you are using main port, it's very expensive. So if you are using in the main port, uh, you, if you have these capabilities, then you can actually observe both in optical and NIR in the same night. And uh, not only, uh, I mean, we develop instrument, we also uh, actually pay attention to the human resource development in the country, basically when uh, TIRCAM 2 was commissioned in IGO and, and we have a lot of infrared observations. So we actually uh, had one first workshop of a real in, in near infrared observations and instrumentation program in 2009 in TIFR balloon facilities. And then when TRISPEX was commissioned in SCT, we have second workshop again in TIFR balloon facility to train students for data analysis observation. And recently when TENSPEC was commissioned in 3.6 meter DOT, again we have a, another workshop on instrumentation in star formation. Now in near future, we are basically now going from single slit to multi-slit spectrographs. So there are two instrumentation programs which are actually going on in TIFR. They are in advanced stage, basically targeting first for 3.6 DOT, but they can be scalable for larger Indian telescope in future. Uh, now I will move to the space program. We'll start, I will start with the balloon. So since... Our, 
late 90s, from 1999, we have started far infrared spectroscopy at 150 micron, which is singly ionized carbon line in far infrared wavelength. And the, this telescope has been basically, so this, we, we are basically using one Fabry Perot spectrometer, which has a resolution of 1800s, which can give velocity resolution of 170 kilometer per second. This is a very intense joint collaboration between India, DIFR, and Japan from uh, ISAS and Nagoya University. And we have been flying this telescope uh, for far infrared observation very regularly from Hyderabad. We had a last flight in uh, 18 February last year. And we are basically observing the star forming region in C2 line. The advantage of this uh, uh, um, experiment is basically one can actually observe really the southern object, extreme southern object, for example, like Carina Nebula, which is actually located at minus 60 degree declination. So that is the advantage from the location. We, when you are close to galactic equator, you can observe both northern and southern object from Hyderabad. And another advantage with balloon observation is that you can actually observe the large uh, uh, area of the mapping you can do. So for example, then you can compare the dust continuum with the C2 line observations. And also with this kind of observation, you can simultaneously observe the C2 line as well as the uh, continuum so that you can actually study the dust, uh, uh, dust and gas properties of this star forming region. And now in the near future, we are upgrading this single detector, which is we are using single de detector fabry pyro spectrometer to the five by five array. And uh, this work is in an advanced stage. We are also upgrading our telemetry uh, rate from 10 kilo PPS to 256. And a lot of work is done on electronics and so on. So the final part of my talk is uh, just to mention that we also did a lot of work, extensive work for the one of the payload, which was basically targeted for future infrared mission, uh, space mission. This is called Infrared Spectroscopic Imaging Survey, uh, which basically uh, uh, targeted for a spectroscopic survey of the Milky Way uh, from 1.7 to 6.4 micron which with two channel spectrometer with a moderate resolution and uh, this, so for so we have basically already developed the laboratory model of this payload uh, in TIFR lab uh, with as, uh, we have used only the single channel right now 1.7 to 2.5 micron and this spectrometer basically uses the fibers where we take the light from land fiber here we have a lenslet and fiber takes the light and which makes a slit at the entrance of the collimator, uh, spectrometer camera. So for the lab model, we have used only 70 by 75 micro lenses and 45 infrared fibers. And uh, so all this work was done in house. All this uh, mechanical structure were basically designed and fabricated in TIFR workshop. The spectrometer was also developed and installed in uh, basically, this is the IFU, in the, this is the laboratory setup for this IFU, which was tested. We checked the spectra results, and finally, we got the spectra from the lab model in the lab, which basically, if you compare with the model spectra, which matches quite well. So basically, we have successfully completed the laboratory model of this payload, and now we have actually submitted report to the ISRO. The one of the main uh, problem with this infrared missions is that cryogenic because you need the cryogenic and particularly when you are going in a space these detector has to be cooled around 80k if you are using mercury cadmium telluride kind of detectors so right now we are working with the ursc team their thermal team to basically design the passive cooling system for such kind of payload which can actually cool the, the telescope structure and the infrared detector and uh, uh, so this will be very important uh, for even for the future missions of IR when we are planning in the near future because we will need the passive cooling because active cooling is very costly and the lifetime is very short. So this is the summary of my talk. So for ground-based astronomy, all our programs are now all going. We have already developed and demonstrated. These are actually already on the telescope. Future, we are going from single slit to multi-slit spectrograph work is in progress. Uh, this space program, uh, now our balloon program is will upgraded to the uh, new detector, 5x5 array detectors, where we will have a high resolution uh, spectroscopy in C2 line. Particularly, we can now study the kinematics and dynamics of the star forming region. So far, we were studying the morphology. Uh, this model, model of a space payload is completed, and we are working on passive cooling system. Then probably we can go for the PDR. And also, we are thinking a pathfinder 
Finder for L2 program, so this work is also going on TIFR. This was actually presented in 2018 to ISRO committee. Uh, so uh, I think our ground-based program could not have been successful without the support of many members from different institutions like from PRL, IIA. I have given only few names here uh, because uh, we got the uh, access to the telescope to demonstrate the performance of these students and uh, that's why these programs were actually realized. And uh, I would also like to thank whole infrared astronomy group uh, for their contributions for the infrared astronomy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roja. Any questions? So I think that's about all. Uh, and we thank Dr. Roja again. And the next talk is. This is pointer? No. This pointer and yeah. this is this is pointer. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm very grateful to the uh, ASI and the Indian astronomy community for this uh, recognition. And I will <laughs> strive to be worthy of this recognition. Uh, today I will speak a little bit about the gravitational lensing of gravitational waves, which is something that I've been excited about in the last uh, few years. Um, just to keep the expectations under check, uh, I should start by saying that we have not yet detected the lensing of gravitational waves. But there is a reasonable expectation that that would happen in the next few years. And, um, as a result, there has been a lot of excitement in the gravitational wave community in the last few years about the study of the lensing of gravitational waves. And uh, there has been a lot of work across the world, uh, including in India. And in my talk, um, I won't be able to cover, I won't be able to do justice to this uh, wide variety of work happening um, across the world. Um, instead, I will try to focus on some of the work that I have personally been um, involved in. And I should uh, start by thanking several um, organizations and individuals who have made this possible. Um, uh, modern research in astronomy and astrophysics is a, a highly collaborative effort. This is in particular true in the field that I work in, uh, in gravitational astronomy. All this work was not possible without these uh, large collaborations of scientists across the world, uh, like Overgo Kagra collaboration the Indian Consortium uh, of Gravitational Physicists, Physicists, INDIGO, the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, LIGO India Scientific Collaboration, as well as uh, ICTS, which uh, has been hosting me over the last decade and has provided um, unwavering support to our research program. Um, but most importantly, all this work that I, I, spoke, I speak about here um, are done by a large number of my young colleagues. Um, many of them have gone through ICTS um, either as postdocs or, 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 fac or, or uh, postdocs. And many of them have started faculty positions re recently, including Shashwat at Ayuka, Harris at NIT, uh, um, Arif in, in, in Kolkata, et cetera. Um, but also I have several uh, colleagues and collaborators um, across the world. So I'll be speaking on, on behalf of them. Um, we heard from Arun uh, this afternoon that um, you know, gravitation wave astronomy has really begun well and good. And it is also clear to us that these are really only the baby steps of this new branch of um, astronomy. Uh, in, the in the first three observing runs of, of LIGO and Virgo, we have observed order 100 gravitational wave signals, all coming from the mergers of compact objects, either black holes or neutron stars. The first half of the fourth observing run has just concluded earlier this month. And just in this uh, observing run, about six months or so, we have observed practically an equal number of candidates in about uh, 80 um, gravitational waves that, that 
you observe in the last you know, seven years. Uh, of course, uh, the data from the, this fourth observing run uh, is only being analyzed, so we only have these candidates, and I, but I expect that the numbers won't change dramatically. Um, it, it tells, and I won't say a lot about this, we heard uh, quite about uh, a detailed uh, status report of the gravitational astronomy from um, Arun this morning. So this is a, a cartoon of the compact objects discovered by um, LIGO and Virgo uh, in the last seven years or so. But I, the vertical axis here is the mass of these compact objects uncovered by these observations. And I wanted, uh, would like you to sort of notice that on average, these black holes that we detect are very, very massive, you know, order 50 solar mass or, 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 or even higher. And this is something that would, you know, of, of, of relevance in the later part of this talk. So moving on, uh, these detectors like LIGO and Virgo continue to improve their sensitivity. And with each modest improvement in sensitivity, we are gaining a large access to a, a larger volume of the local universe that, that we are sensitive to. So the detection rates will continue to increase by a large power of the um, sensitivity. So in the next decade or so, we will be detecting confidently hundreds to thousands of gravitational waves. So we are really opening up a huge catalog of sources in the next decade or so. And uh, most importantly for our community, the LIGO India also will contribute to these observations in the next decade. And uh, there are uh, ongoing plans and proposals to build um, improve the existing detector or install better detectors in the existing facilities. These are called a -Shark or Voyager, etc. And also ongoing plans to build the next generation of gravitational detectors. Uh, both this happens primarily in the US and, and Europe with a factor of 10 improvement in sensitivity. And these detectors would see practically all binary black hole mergers happening in the universe up to the uh, extreme horizon uh, that, that we have sources. Apart from these sort of guaranteed sources, we are also hoping to see new phenomena using these upcoming um, observation runs as well as new detectors. This includes a potential detection of the stochastic astrophysical foreground, just almost guaranteed, produced by this large number of compact binary mergers, uh, spinning neutral stars in our own galaxy, and uh, perhaps a galactic supernova if it happens and uh, the, the lensing, gravitational lensing of gravitational waves, which is the top, topic of, of this talk. Here is a cartoon of uh, gravitational lensing in action. There is a, a foreground galaxy in between us and a distant source, and because of the space-time curvature caused by this foreground galaxy, multiple paths can connect the source and the observer, and the observer can see multiple images of this. And we know that gravitational lensing has, has been a really powerful tool for astronomical observations in the last in a few decades. Um, the remarkable observations uh, include finding evidence of, of dark matter. This, for example, is a remarkable observation of the bullet cluster and map ma mapping out the distribution of dark matter across the universe and understanding, possibly hinting some uh, about the nature of dark matter, whether, for example, what fraction of the dark matter is in the form of compact objects. This is, for example, coming from this weak lensing observation. This particular is from the um, a Subaru uh, with a large contribution from the Indian community also. Uh, lensing has enabled us to see some of the first stars and galaxies because of some extreme magnification that, that it produced. Um, lensing has detect, you know, produced um, detection, enable of, uh, enabled detection of exoplanets, for example. So there is a, a huge amount of science that came out uh, in different aspects of astronomy and cosmology uh, enabled by these lensing observations. And just like light, Gravitational waves are also lensed by intervening objects like galaxies and clusters of galaxies as well as compact objects. Um, we can do a, a, an estimate and it, it turns out that order 0.1% to about 1% of the total binary black holes that we will observe in the next you know, years to decades will be strongly lensed by intervening galaxies and, and some of them would be lensed by clusters also. Here's a little cartoon of this gravitational lensing in action. So what we would see is something analogous to this, this strongly lensed quasar. You would see multiple images. But one very interesting aspect of this is that most of our sources are transient sources. And we will see them, uh, these um, signals arriving at the Earth at different times. So you would see multiple copies of the same signals arriving at different times. And the time delays could be order minutes to several months, depending on the mass of the lens. 
And one crucial difference between the lensing of light and the lensing of gravitational waves is that our angular resolution is so weak that we won't be able to resolve uh, multiple images in the sky. However, we have excellent temporal resolution because we can localize the gravitational waves in time by order 0 0.1, uh, like 0 0.1 millisecond or so. So we have excellent measurement of the time delay which is complementary to the excellent measurement of the angular resolution from uh, optical or, or radio observations. So what are the kind of things that we would see um, uh, as an effect of gravitational lensing? Um, here also, in the, you know, if la galaxies are the most likely lenses, and the wavelength of the gravitational waves are still very, very small as compared to the gravitational uh, scale of the galaxies. So everything is geometric optics, or familiar uh, wave optics, uh, uh, ray optics in the case of uh, lensing by galaxies. So we would see no distortion of the, of the signal. The, the lensing is achromatic. Uh, so we would see basically a magnification. Different images will get different magnifications and different time delays. So you would see multiple copies of the same signal with some relative magnification. It's something that we would uh, want to look for. And this can have interesting impacts. Now we would not know whether a, a signal is lens or not. This means that we don't know its, its magnification. So we will, as a result, incorrectly um, think that this is a closer source because it's amplified. So we'll have a biased estimate of the luminosity distance of the source, which will also affect our estimate of the true mass, true source frame mass of these black holes um, in, these, uh, in the binaries. The reason is that because of the cosmic expansion, we will be measuring a combination, the gravitational waves will be redshifted, and we'll be measuring a combination of the total mass and the cosmological redshift using gravitational observations. To uncover the actual mass, one need to have an inference of the cosmological redshift, which we get from the measurement of the luminosity distance, which is something that we can actually measure using gravitational waves. However, because lensing biases our estimation of the luminosity distance, this will bias, in turn, our estimation of the cosmological redshift, which will, in turn, bias our estimation of the actual mass of the black holes. So it is natural to wonder whether these sort of extreme high-mass black holes that we see using gravitational waves, which are very different from the galactic black hole that we see from X-ray observations, are they a result of the gravitational lensing? And indeed, a group of people, some people have actually proposed this idea. It's a very intriguing idea. But uh, it doesn't seem that if you just invoke standard under our standard understanding of the astrophysics, it, one doesn't need to invoke these rather exotic picture to uh, explain the observed masses of black holes. And it turns out that if we, again, if you take our standard understanding of astrophysics, the probability of seeing a strongly lensed gravitational wave signal in the small number of samples that we detected is rather small. The probability is order 0.1% or even less. And so most of the um, astrophysicists or astronomers don't believe that these are, uh, we have seen yet the evidence of gravitational lensing of gravitational waves yet. However, one cannot rule out that possibility, right? One has to be open to that possibility. So what is the real smoking gun evidence of gravitational lensing of gravitational waves? So one should see something like these multiple lens quasar. One should see multiple copies of the same signal, the same shapes coming from the same location in the sky, the time delay that is consistent with uh, our expectation from the distribution of galaxies and, and cluster masses. Uh, this is rather hard to do because we are still living in a moderate signal to noise ratio regime. So one has to resort into some statistical method. So our group, uh, our colleagues have developed a Bayesian model selection uh, method to identify uh, strongly lens gravitational waves. The idea is that if you take a pair of events, you can ask the question, are these pair of events uh, lensed counterparts of the same merger, or they are coming from two independent mergers happening at different parts of the universe. So it turns out that one could cast in the case of this in the, in, 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 in the language of a Bayesian model selection. And you have also additional information. The time delay between the two events also tells something. If these two events are unrelated, the time delay has some Poisson statistics. However, the distribution of time delay between lensed events depending, depends on the distribution of matter, large scale structure in the universe, which we have some understanding of. So we can use this information of the time delay between multiple events also to, to, to write down a likelihood ratio between the lens hypothesis and the unlensed hypothesis given a pair of events. And one could do simulations to see how well we'll be able to distinguish between lensed events and unlensed events. Here is a simulation that shows 
Uh, this is a, like a, a, a likelihood ratio based on the shape of the signal and the likelihood ratio based on the distribution of time delays. And uh, the real lens signals are the black ones, and the unlensed signals are these um, green ones. So they live in two different parts of this parameter space. And one could look at the data and see if we have any, we see any, any significant evidence for uh, lensed gravitational waves in the data. And so far, we do not see any significant um, uh, um, lens events. One could, um, so this, one could speed up these, these basic in parameter estimation, which is still a rather computationally expensive uh, process. Uh, using machine learning, this becomes a useful thing in the future because once the number of events increase, the number of pairs would increase as NC2. So we will have to do this process for a large number of uh, times. So it is useful to have some fast and accurate methods for for um, developing, uh, for identifying lens gravitational waves. And this is a um, uh, work by our uh, former graduate student, uh, Srishti Goyal, which shows that um, one could do machine learning to, to come up with uh, a statistic that is uh, almost as good as this optimal Bayesian model selection. So even though we have not yet detected lens gravitational waves, we can use it to constrain the merge rate of compact boundaries at very high redshifts, which we don't have access to. So even the non-detection is telling you something. So what, it'll be interesting to see, once you detect lensed gravitational waves, what can I tell? So one very intriguing idea proposed by some of our colleagues is that, to that it turns out that by combining this with some optical follow-ups, even in the absence of an electromagnetic counterpart, one can localize a binary black hole merger in the galaxy. And this is something very unique, and it's probably the only way one could potentially localize a binary black hole merger um, um, using gravitational observations. Another idea is that using multiple copies of the same signal, uh, one can extract the polarization of gravitational waves much more accurately. It's a very important uh, step because according to GR, gravitational waves have only two polarizations. But there are alternative theories that predict more polarizations. And with a small number of detectors in the network, we are unable to entangle these possibilities very well. Essentially, gravitational waves basically doubles the number of effective detectors or multiplies the number of effective detectors to measure the same polarizations. And, we have, and you, can, you are able to uh, disentangle these correlations and measure the polarizations much more accurately. Um, and also, with the next generation of detectors, we will be detecting millions of gravitational wave events in a, in a decade or so. And even a small fraction is a very large number of lensed events, about 10, of, tens of thousands of gravitational waves will be strongly lensed by uh, intervening objects like galaxies and clusters. And the distribution of time delay between these lensed events will contain not only imprints of the distribution of sources and the distribution of lenses, but also the cosmological parameters also. So if you have some independent inputs, like the distribution of sources from the unlensed measurements and distribution of lenses from some cosmological simulations, one can use this to actually do cosmography. One can measure the cosmic expansion rate at different redshifts, and one can actually measure the cosmological parameters with precision comparable to other cosmological probes. Here is a work by um, uh, Savik Jana, who is a, uh, a graduate student at ICT, which shows that uh, future observations can uh, future observations of lensed gravitational waves can be used as a new probe of, of cosmography. Um, he also showed uh, in an upcoming work that it can actually also probe the nature of dark matter also, which remains to be an important puzzle in, still in, in astronomy. The idea here is that if the dark matter is not cold as, uh, as in, the, in the standard model, if the dark matter is a warm particle, a, high energy, a higher energy particle, then it suppresses the formation of low mass dark matter halos in the, in the universe. And the dis so that will affect the distribution of lenses that will contribute to gravitational lensing. So this would have an imprint on the distribution of time delays of lensed gravitational waves, which with future observations one could constrain. And in particular, one could constrain this, this model of warm dark matter mass to some uh, uh, pretty guy, um, uh, interesting string value using future observations. So, so far, I've been talking about the lensing of gravitational waves in the geometric optic regime, which is something that we are familiar with in the case of, of lensing of, of electromagnetic waves. However, for the very first time, gravitational waves lensing would open us a way of um, observing the lensing in the wave optics or diffraction regime. 
So if the gravitational waves are lensed by a compact object whose Schwarzschild radius is comparable to the wavelength of gravitational waves, then the diffraction effects will dominate. And this will introduce very interesting and characteristic deformations in the observed gravitational waves. So here are some, you know, some theoretical calculations that shows how lensing would distort a gravitational wave signal in a characteristic way. This is something that we could look for. And again, we have looked for it. Again, you could use some Bayesian model selection. So far, we do not see any evidence of such distorted gravitational waves in our data. Here's a distribution of these sort of likelihood ratio between a lensed and unlensed hypothesis. So the uh, blue is the foreground actual events, and the, the uh, orange dash is a background event. So we do not see any significant detection of these wave optics lensing. But even this absence of detection of wave optic lensing could be used to put an upper limit on the abundance of black holes, primordial black hole that could potentially contribute to the um, dark matter. So this shows what fraction, this non, what the, from the non-detection of order 80, uh, non-detection of wave optic lensing effects from this order 80 gravitational wave events, what is the kind of constraint that we can place on the uh, fraction of dark matter in the form of compact objects. These are not so great at this point, but with future observations, we'll be able to improve these constraints. So this would essentially point out, a, provide a new way of probing the nature of dark matter. But we could also ask um, whether uh, the lensing, the positive detection of such lensed gravitational waves, how well can you probe the nature of this, this compact object itself? Is it indeed a black hole? If it, is it a, what is the charge of the black hole? How it is a spin? Whether it has any exotic properties, et cetera. So here is a sort of a pilot work that has recently uh, came out from another graduate student at ICTS, Udeep Pradeka, which shows how a future observation of a lensed gravitational wave can be used to constrain the charge of a black hole lens. I'll finish in just uh, the, the, the one slide. This is the last slide in the, the science. One could also now um, speculate the possibility of detecting the lensing of other kinds of gravitational wave sources, for example, spinning neutron stars in our own galaxy. So there is an estimation of about 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 spinning neutron stars in our own galaxy. And depending on the quadrupolar ellipticity of these sources, we will be able to detect continuous gravitational waves from some of these neutron stars in the next decade. Some of them could be actually behind the galactic supermassive black hole and could be strongly lensed by it. If we detect, and uh, we did a, in a, last year we come up with a paper which is led by Somidhi Basak and, and Aditya Sharma, both at ICTS, which shows that we have a reasonable modest probability of detecting such lensed continuous gravitational waves using these upcoming generation of detectors. If that happens, there'll be a very interesting probe of the galactic center and its black hole because we are doing a tomography using gravitational waves and it's a very, very powerful way of, of probing the center of the galaxy. So let me stop here. Uh, as we all know, the gravitational bending of light was the first observational test that really heralded the success of Einstein's theory over the next century. But eventually it became a really powerful tool for astronomers and cosmologists. And the story of gravitational waves is also very similar. It has now becoming a powerful tool for astronomy, a new branch of astronomy. And the first observation of gravitationally lensed gravitational waves should happen in the next few years, if not in the next decade. And this is a potentially new tool for astronomers and cosmologists. So I think we, are, we have reasons to be excited about it. We thank you all, and uh, I'll stop here, and thank you very much. Thank you, Ajit. Questions? Yes. There. Couple of questions actually. So optics, uh, you use this spectroscopy to figure out that they are coming from the same thing, right? And here you don't have that uh, leverage. So uh, how you actually figure out that? Yeah, so essentially is what you have is a mark.
Yeah, so this is an interesting... How, how, sorry? Yeah, this is a forecast for future, right? We are assuming that we will be detecting a million gravitational waves and about 10,000 will be lensed. So this will have to wait maybe 2035 or 30, 2040. So we have to wait at least 10 and possibly 15 years to see something like this to be realized. No, no, these, these are using the next generation of ground-based observatories. Because LISA is not going to see such a large number of sources. Uh, I have a question, Ajit. Uh, so can I ask? Yeah. So uh, you mentioned that those lensing is not detected yet. So is it possible because that uh, the, between the source and us, there is no such uh, galaxy uh, there to lens the gravitational wave because the detector sensitivity is dependent on the uh, like it is proportional to one by d. Yeah. So uh, the distance matters. Yeah. So is it the reason? Yeah. Okay. The lensing probability is basically the what is the. Assumed, it computed assuming an electricity of 10 to the minus 8. Okay. It could be then smaller. Can you, can if it's you, smaller than that, yeah, there is no hope of detecting Okay. So can you, uh, I mean, there, is there any chance to detect it with the Einstein telescope or conspicuous? Right? Yeah, the point that really we don't know what is the uh, actual electricity of actual neutron stars. Yeah. In fact, I, the only time I heard a lower limit on electricity is from Sudeep uh, from TAFR, and I was very intrigued by that. Uh, okay, thanks. So we don't know really. about this uh, ruling out uh, the like gravitationally lensed events you know uh, as you said um, that the extreme mass events that we see there is binary black holes uh, they could be present due to that so uh, the question is the result that you show like there is some uh, evidence which we talked about and what is the gravitationally accepted distribution yeah Yeah. 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 So it is true. So we we cannot at this point make a concrete statement that it is not the case. There is that possibility still exists. Uh, so in fact, we have an ongoing project to ask whether this claim is at least internally consistent, right? So if you assume this particular, you know, fi rather fine-tuned distribution of the merger rate and the mass, etc. And you make all the observable predictions, the, the shift of the mass distribution, the number of double events, and the non-observation of stochastic background, et cetera. Is it consistent with all these observations? So we have some ongoing work. Uh, we don't have a result yet. Yeah. Interesting to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so thank you, Ajit. And let us thank all the speakers again. I think they have kept very good timing and we are not bad off.